Part of this survival course is about giving people time to experiment with natural materials. Grass, for example, provides excellent insulation for clothing or bedding. As the course develops, the students will be expected to sleep in shelters made solely from what they can find around them. Okay, this is the shelter that you're going to be using for the next phase of the course. It's the thermal A-frame, and it's a standard shelter that we'd recommend for almost all environments, other than probably in places where you can't get wood, or even in the jungle where uh, you don't want to be sleeping on the ground. A-frame shelters are basic to construct, but in extreme environments have time and again proved to be lifesavers. The key is to make the shelter just big enough to cover your whole body. I'm going to give you some tips there. It's very difficult to make one of these uh, lattice like this work. Uh -huh. you know, you keep falling apart, don't they? Yeah. All Much time. easier is to, to build it with these rafters closer together. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And instead of trying to make a lattice like this, yeah. What you can do is just they've got natural hooks and things on them. Just hook them in at an angle like that. Yeah. With one end on the ground crisscross them a, a bit like that and you'll affect the same but it's a lot easier you can just lay it on let gravity do the work okay and, and make sure these aren't too long if these poke out too much they catch the rain and it runs onto the underside and takes a fast track to you okay okay yeah no worries that's what I'm after see that root yeah. We can use that, we have to uncover it very carefully. Use that like wire. How's that? It's quite good. <laughs> that. I think I need, to get, I need to get bigger bits. Um. Yeah. When building this shelter, it's important to stack plenty of layers of branches and moss on the outside to give protection from the wind and rain packing the centre with loads of bracken or dry grass for insulation. Do you feel you might ever be in a situation where you had to fall back on these skills? Um, yeah, I mean certainly we went out at the, at the moment in the Balkans, Bosnia uh, and into Kosovo and certainly these kind of skills, it's this, it's this kind of woodland that uh, you're going to end up in. Um, so if you do end up in, uh, in enemy territory or even in, in friendly territory but there's uh, a time before the guys can come and get you out, you need to be able to survive, you need to be able to protect yourself uh, and this is you know, the, the ideal way of doing it. Fire is the most important skill of survival. Fire relates to protection in that it can warm you. It relates to location, it can give your presence a way to rescue us. It concerns water and it makes it safe to drink and it concerns food in that it makes foods edible. It's very important, you mustn't underestimate it. I've devoted my life to learning traditional methods of fire lighting and in most parts of the world, I can get a fire going just with the materials I find in nature. There you go. All military personnel carry fire sticks in their survival packs but actually using them successfully isn't always as easy as it looks. It did work earlier on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you start to hear that now, you hear this crackling, that's air getting in amongst it as it starts to burn. Okay, thanks mate. This instructor is demonstrating the art of making a signal fire to attract passing aircraft. The trick with this fire is to use dry tinder at the bottom and wet leafy material on top. This combination creates vast plumes of white smoke, which will hopefully penetrate the forest canopy and alert passing planes. There's an old saying in survival, proper preparation prevents poor performance, and these words should be remembered when building signal fires. In this case, a potential rescue aircraft would have been and gone by the time these students got their fire going. Survival techniques take years to learn, so these RAF personnel can't be expected to learn it all in a matter of weeks. But they're not playing at it. In a real survival situation, they'll need to know how to find food, by both fair means or foul. Try again.
On your walkabouts, you may come across a tree where there are obvious signs of squirrels. And if you, you'll know there's squirrels up there because there's chattering noises. You can see them jumping from branch to branch occasionally. Put snares all around the tree. When he's stuck his head in there, he's going to be pulling on it and so on. You won't tend to fall and die in this position. This is where use of its body weight comes in because as he struggles, he will kick off and move to one side. They are very, very agile and the more slack you've got on it, the harder it's going to be for him to get away. You're going to want to find some other methods of catching things. And by taking the inner cord from inside the parachute cord, you can make an interesting trap for ground feeding birds. Get any fruit that you can off of a tree and then thread it through a piece of your inner cord. You want a couple of meters of line that the bird finds this in the location where he's already used to eating the fruit and then works his way along eating and swallowing the line as he goes all the way along until he reaches an area where he's run out of fruit and it's also tethered directly to a peg strongly driven into the ground he'll try and walk away but he's already ingested about two meters of cord wrapped up into his stomach so he's not able to move as long as you check it regularly you'll be the one who catches this bird and not some other predator like a fox they are good eating. Okay, they started to become quite popular in a number of restaurants, which tended to sort of die out because people don't like the idea of eating something that's cute and furry. But because of the nature of the animal, there's very little fat in it. It's a very, very nice tasting meat. All that's perfectly edible and will make good eating. Even though these men and women could go to war at any time, it's clear that some of them find the prospect of eating a squirrel unappealing. But they need this kind of exposure. People have died in survival situations because they couldn't cope with the idea of killing and eating animals, either for moral reasons or simply repulsion. Once again, a very effective method of cooking because you're going to sear it and so it's going to be safe to eat. Obviously, by keeping the skin, it retains a layer of fat, fat being a very important ingredient in this survival situation. But if you don't want the fat, it's very simple to peel it off. We're not looking at things necessarily that taste delicious and look like something we buy from Sainsbury's on a weekend. We're looking at something that in extremis is going to keep us alive. It's lovely. On this course, RAF personnel aren't expected to live off wild animals. Instead, they're given a pheasant or chicken to pluck, gut and cook. As so many people are used to eating cellophane wrapped meat, students often struggle with the basics of preparing a bird for roasting. Feathers are coming off easily, got into the skin, and you can see there's maggots and worms and God knows what else. So um, this one will definitely have to be buried and gotten rid of as far from camp as possible. In fact, there's nothing wrong with this bird. What he thought were maggots was actually corn inside the bird's gizzard. A costly mistake when you're starving. I wouldn't like to kill the animal, but if, um, if I was hungry enough, which I'm sure I would get in that situation, then yeah, I'd have to. In long-term survival situations, meat becomes very important because in this temperate environment, you simply can't live on plants alone for any length of time. And particularly here with acidic soils and winter on its way, edible plants are almost impossible to find. But there are some useful plants like this one. This is sphagnum moss. Now that can be cleaned up, boiled, strained and dried to be ready to use as a wound dressing because it's incredibly absorbent and in fact it was used in both the first and the second world wars for field dressings and there's, then there's this this is polypody and this fern the root of it can be made into teas to treat bronchial disorders and sore throats both useful medicines for people on the run Dartmoor is a very beautiful place to be. I always like coming here. Down there in that wood, that's where the students are in camp at the moment. Nice cosy experience, warm fires, shelters. And that's all going to end tonight because then they have to do a night navigation exercise. Now Dartmoor is famous for being difficult to navigate in by daylight because of the barren, featureless terrain. But tonight, it'll be even more difficult. They're going to have to pay really careful attention to their compass bearings and the paces they're taking. Added to that, they've got to cross one of the...